Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology and Around. My guest today is uh, Mike Erie. Mike has been a pastor of several different, uh, very large churches in Southern California, and then he took a hiatus from ministry for a little bit, and now he's back in ministry as a, a teaching pastor at Journey Church outside of Nashville, um, Tennessee. He's also the host of um, a podcast that's very similar to Theology and Raw. It's called Voxology. It was formerly called the Vox Podcast. If you have not listened to Mike Erie's podcast, I think you would really enjoy it if you enjoy this one at all. Mike is just a brother from another mother. We, um, yeah, I, we, we, I don't think we've ever hung out in person, but we've known each other for years online. You know, he's endorsed some of my books. I've had him on the podcast before. We chit chat back and forth, not as much as I would like, but periodically he's just a great, great, honest dude, curious dude. And I'm excited for you to listen to him. So please welcome back to the show. The one and only Mike Erie. Dude, you're one of those guests that I want to have on like every other week. And, uh, I don't, oh. I, I, it's been a while well, since you've been on and that's so unfortunate. It's totally on, on me. I'm sorry. Listen, it's when two, when two guys, who are similarly um, good looking and similarly <laughs> intelligent. I mean, I, I get that there's a bit of a, like the opposite of magnetism. I get that. I get that. And so I understand that I'm threatening in some ways and it's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> so you, you'll notice I mean, if you go, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, you notice we don't have a YouTube channel and now you're seeing the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> so last time we talked, you were in exile back in Ohio. <laughs> well, I just read yes, so actually the opposite. Lord. But um, you're down in Nashville now, past pastoring or part of a. I, don't know, I forget your Dude, role. You yes. lead or teaching pastor? How'd that come about? Teaching pastor. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So so like a lot of us, um, I had done the the mega church thing mm -hmm. and had done it according to the values and systems, you know, that were kind of handed down and, um, and realized I was just not a very good one. Um, <laughs> and, um, I ended up planning, planning a church, but I had some health challenges and my mom had some health challenges. And so moved to Ohio and we were there for four years and I just thought, okay, well, I'll just do podcasting and, mm -hmm. and that's it. But I really began, um, not shocking to anybody, but I really began to miss having a flesh and blood community where some of the stuff we were talking about on the yeah. podcast could be worked out. So we weren't just critiquing things because that's easy, right, right, right. but, but we were working to create something that, that, that felt a bit different. And, um, and so I, I began with a close circle of, of people to just ask God, God, would you allow me to serve in the church again? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a lead, lead pastor. I don't, I'm, I'm not, gifted and I'm not interested in the the maintenance of the organization. Yeah. But man, to work out the text in a flesh and blood community, yeah. That was super compelling. And then two weeks later I got a call from a friend who I'd worked with at um a church in California. And he said, Hey, we we we're, you know, a 300, 400 person church and we're looking for a teaching pastor. And would you be interested? And it was like a no brainer. Wow. So it's been it's been awesome. Wow. So to have to have a podcast on the yeah. one hand where you can experiment and learn and yeah. be curious, but then to have a flesh and blood community that you're talking to every week, that that dynamic, that dual dynamic for me has been the healthiest dynamic I've been in in a long time. I, I've got a question no, that thinking... I've had I've got a question that I've had on my mind for a while, and I think you might be the right person that um ask i'm going to ask real quick but i want to table it because i have more questions about your church um what oh. is what is the ecclesiological role of a podcast oh, this man. thing is so new it has become yes. very um incredibly influential disruptive and yet it yes. seems to just ex like be driving in a completely parallel lane as a typical right. rhythm of ecclesiology you seemed i mean ah, what the heck let's just dive in right now because you you started a church I've never heard of this before back, back in California, right? Um, they grew out of the yeah. podcast. Like it was the podcast right. community that was local and you started right. a church. Can yes. you tell us a little bit more about that? And would you recommend oh that? Goodness. Is that something that we should be doing more <laughs> of? Or? Oh, I, you know, so, so the, the, that is such a good question, Preston. Oh my goodness. And I've wrestled with that so much. How and I've actually okay. talked to some really, 
Oh yeah, I've never heard anybody what, frame the, it that way. Like, what what is the the relationship between the podcast right. world, Christian podcast world, doing Christian things or whatever, and 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 the local church? I you know. Yeah. So I mean, it, the fact that you even asked that question, that just um, it shows how impoverished I think the American imagination is about church. That we don't that that is fertile ground for more conversation. But um, for me, I, I had left. I'd had a really hard experience at a at a large church, very traditional church, and I thought in my arrogance that I could just kind of teach my way into some things without having to do the really hard shepherding work of loving people over the course of decades into the future. Hmm. And, um, and so there was a lot on me that was immature and impatient. There were some things and some dynamics in the church that were super painful, uh, that were being expressed to my wife and I. And so I resigned pretty abruptly, um, and and looking back on it, I, I I was wrong to do so. I was wrong to I was wrong in the way that I handled it. Okay. For sure, um, I was not doing what was best for the church. I was doing what I thought was best for me. And I know there's a fine line in there, mm-hmm. but I should have been more patient. And I mean all the things. But I found myself just one day without pastoring, and I thought, okay, I think I'm I think I'm done with this. Mm. You know, I've tried it and I don't know that I'm very good at it, but I'm I'm like you, good at taking content and kind of yeah. exploring it and reducing it down to accessible forms and whatever else. And so we started a podcast that it wasn't going to be like a talk show format and it wasn't going to just be exclusively interviews. It was going to be some some like original content. Mm-hmm. And we found there to be this kind of church refugee sort of audience for the content. The first podcast we did was Why Gay Marriage is Good for the Church. The (laughs) Oberfell um, decision had just come down. And and I was just making the point, oh, wow, well, we have to confront now all of the double standards about how we treat sexual sin. (laughs) We have to talk about sexuality in ways that are far more compelling. We have to have good answers for why gay people – are treated the way they've been treated. Yeah. And, and that, you know, I could never have had that conversation in a, in an organized ecclesia, but there were so many Why? people that, that were, I have a problem with that, but you're acknowledging just me something too. that is. Me but, too. Yeah. Yes, yeah. me too. Uh, Cause I always thought the church should be the safest place to talk about anything. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I mean, that seems like that should be, that should be the case. Uh, but the podcast format opened up that opportunity without the attendant violations of ecclesial authority and permission and structure. And so we found this kind of broad audience of people who wanted to have those conversations, but just they weren't allowed to mm-hmm. in traditional evangelical structures. So similar to you, right? We're able to explore things. And have conversations even with people that, you know, with whom we deeply disagree that allow us to um, talk about cultural realities in ways that don't have to honor this massive institution and the financial basis behind it. Yeah. And so what was interesting is um, we then um, did a couple of meetups and realized, oh, my goodness, there's a church here, <laughs> but a, but a unique kind of church we organized around the Eucharist. Um, we uh, we opened the service with the sermon, and the sermon's point was to lead into the Eucharist. It wasn't some mm. awe-inspiring, you know, killer sermon series. We, uh, questions and answers, and we, we really emphasized table fellowship and all those things. And we found that there was this beautiful pre-cultural work that had been done by the podcast mm that allowed for a pretty quick assimilation into a church culture that was unique and I'd never sort of seen happen before. Hmm. So I think there is an a, there is a place, but I think Christian podcasts are different. For some, it's just the sermon that yeah. we do. For others, it's interview and exploring different topics through different personalities. Mm-hmm. For others, it's kind of a talk show that is just yeah. fun and, and light and – Whatever. And um, I think there's a place for exploration of of scripture and culture 
that does lend itself to follow up, um, whether it's sharing a meal or whether it's Q&A or further discussion or whatever. And so we even see that now. One of the biggest requests we get on our podcast is, well, how do I find like-minded listeners? Hmm. And we've yeah. tried to organize something called micro communities that COVID totally interrupted. But there was a lot of energy uh, around people trying to find like-minded churches and people to kind of continue the conversations with. How, how did you manage? So I think we, what, what does that look like? How, how did you did you have some kind of online platform for them to find other people? Or we were working on that. Okay. We were working on that, and th- there are some out there now. But we just got requests. Hey, do you know of a good church in? Okay. Arizona, do you know of a good church? And so we'd throw that back to our audience and our audience would say, I don't know of one in Arizona, but I'm, I'm here in Arizona and would love to hook up with somebody. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, there, I, there was this natural desire to sort of incarnate some of the, the relational dynamics that we were embodying mm-hmm. in the way we were doing the podcast that I think in some ways could do a lot of work towards building a unifying culture um, with people that have no other reason to exist together. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, I do think there's a role there. Absolutely. Did, did you, so you, I mean, like if I, if I did that, I would probably have like seven people at my church here and boy, like I don't have a big local fo- following. I don't think. Yeah. Um, but like your, your listeners, when you started it, were, were they largely local because yes. probably because of your yes. pastoral platform. So a lot of, okay. Totally. So that wouldn't work yeah. for all. But, podcast no not at all but since we've since um so i've been out of california i think five years now um that that impulse has has not gone away but it's more you know vastly more spread out so Mm -hmm. people in texas or people in we've had people in other countries like you i mean that that are that are looking for some sort of connection through the podcast yeah um, that that they're not finding in a local church, and that's good and bad. Yeah, is right? that going to become? Is that going to replace the church? Like, um, right. It, it I right. got thoughts about that. Even some pros and cons to that. Well, that's what it is. It's a total trade off. Well, should it's hard. we like, encourage that, or should we not? Well, it's hard because I'll get comments. I mean, just amazing, like people saying, you know, you. I, I, I finally can ask a hard question. You talk about things that I'm thinking about, but I've never heard talk about church. Yeah. Um, I, you know, or I've had people say, you know, you've been my pastor for the last few years and all these things. Yeah. I'm like, no, yeah. no, no. Like, but then they tell me about their church situation or options. And I'm like, well, it, it's hard like that. I, I'm hundred percent not trying to replace the church, be the church, be of course. somebody's pastor. Um, but it's, is it my fault that people are at places that they can't even ask a hard theological question and either get right, like either look down, look down upon or get some canned answer that it's like, yeah, but I've got a thousand reasons why your response doesn't really match scripture. You know, like, totally. I yeah. don't know, like it's not, um, do I cancel theology in Iran and you know, throw it back on the church to do it? Or if they're not doing stuff, I, you know what I mean? Like I... Wait. I do. I, I absolutely, man. I, so here's the impulse that sits behind me. And this is the reason why I wanted to go back into a local church. Okay. For me was um, it's just too easy to critique and not create. Yeah. Right. We would sure. both agree absolutely. like that's deconstructing is the easiest thing in the world these days. Yes. Building something that's, you know, not perfect, but a little different from the norm. is a lot harder and so for me, the ha- to have both arenas yeah. has been the healthy, like I said, the healthiest yeah. I, I've been. So I do think there's a role that the podcast can and should never have okay. in the lives of people. Which is what um, I but I, I that that um, the Eucharistic communal sure. social okay. dynamics the New Testament dev- invites us into. Good. Yeah. I think that a podcast can set the table for a way of seeing the church that allows people to discern healthy from unhealthy or to um, to engage with their normal, average, ordinary church in ways that are much healthier than uh, the just traditional consumeristic. So like, you know, when people say, what do you look for in a church? I'm like, well, the last thing I would look for is teaching because you can get good teaching everywhere, right? You do not need to go to a church 
for some killer sermon series or whatever, but find a church um, that is um, growing together in love, that is manifesting the Sermon on the Mount, that cares about the things that Jesus cares about. And some of that could be teaching great, but that's not the sole thing anymore, Mm -hmm. right? Because we have access to so many other resources. So um, uh, that would be one example of where I think a podcast can help, right? Yeah, It's easy to share. It's not, I'm not inviting you to church. I'm just like, hey, take a listen to this. I know we disagree on this issue, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's almost like, um, like what's the role of like a therapist? You know, like you go to right. therapy oh, when you're dealing good. with anxiety, all, you're dealing with all kinds of things that are really in the category of discipleship, but maybe right. the people at the leaders at church, maybe not be as well equipped in that area. They're just not doing, you know, extensive, robust right. clinical therapy. Um, so in some ways, I mean, it's almost could, could podcasting, depending on the podcast host, almost be akin to like theological therapy <laughs> yeah, or triage. Yeah. Or a triage. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I look at I look at so Dallas Willard mm-hmm. is a guy that we both would adore. And he wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy in the 90s, one of my favorite books ever. And it was so influential and so shaping. Mm-hmm. What was the role of that book in my life? Yeah. Right? Well, was it discipling? Oh my, yes. Absolutely. But was I in touch with him at all? Not at all. Mm-hmm. So I would say. Oh my goodness, God God uses resources beyond the body to inspire body kind of life. Yeah. Of course. So I would say if if it's a healthy podcast, if it's if it's cruciform and focusing on new creation dynamics, then hallelujah, I think that plays a part in discipleship the way a good book might. Oh, that's a great analogy. Yeah. It, it, I think because it is a book does feel way less personal. It's very yeah. two-dimensional and maybe a podcast is is more than that. A little fuller, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, I think that maybe that's why it does get a little bit closer to kind of a church dynamic. Yeah. But like you said, it is it is ultimately disembodied and non-Eucharistic. I love that idea. Um, and, yeah. and therefore yeah. it can't, shouldn't re- replace the yes. church. Yes, What's yes. your current church like? I mean, again, you don't strike me as the type of person that would fit into kind of a traditional church. Model. No. I mean, what, what's the what? What's it's Journey Church, no. right? Journey. Yes. Yeah. What? I, I I have been so impressed by these humans, I, and I know, my goodness, I'm going to speak really positively about them. You're still in the honeymoon um, stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> um, I've been there almost two years, and um, and and it's funny the leadership team is made up of people who've all worked in large churches and have swore they never w- work in churches again. Okay. And um, and so I mean it's it's little things like we have a lead pastor who is unbelievably humble. He's very um, he's gifted in a lot of different ways, but his biggest gift is just collaboration. So there are four of us that that sort of sit on this leadership team. Um, and all the decisions are collaborative. And and I know that's an easy thing to say, Mm. but if you've sat with people who are dominant personalities, you know, that collaboration is never really collaboration. It's like processing to get to whatever it is the, the pastor wants to do. Well, this isn't, isn't like that at all. We have four very gifted individuals who are very specifically gifted in very specific lanes. Um, and so I've never been a part of a, a healthier team that that operates and um, deals with conflict among themselves in healthy ways. Um, the church is, I don't know, it's probably three or four hundred people. So it's at a, it, it's at a size that allows it to not have to fight for survival, but also isn't swamped by yeah. and consumed by all the growth dynamics that tell us what successful churches look like and act like. That might be my favorite size, two to four hundred, five hundred. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. We do two services. It's great. Um, but it's the culture. So um, the culture is Eucharistic. The culture is based around table fellowship, um, which means, you know, we perform our social status at the table of Jesus. And that social status is that we're all gift recipient. Hmm. None of us have a right to be there. and None of us have a right to determine who else gets to come. Um, we. Uh, 
we talk about uh, race in the heart of the South, and that mm. causes heartburn for folks. We um, are in the middle of a series on the Bible where um, where we're talking like like really meta conversations about the Scripture, and it results in. 30 to 50 questions after every service. We do Q, people you do can Q&A interrupt after the sermon. Every, every sermon or talk or? Yes. Okay. Yes. I love that. Yes, yes, yes. I it, love that. Oh, they can text in. It is, it is, it is absolutely phenomenal. Goal of the service, of course, is the use, the Eucharist. We, we've spent, you know, six months in the Sermon on the Mount, but the, but there is a great deal of permission to explore the things that we're talking about right here. Um, because the church isn't invested in its own self-preservation. It's very invested in um, what does it look like in the South to follow Jesus in the midst of the cultural streams that are kind of swirling all around us Mm -hmm. and to create a place where like affirming and not affirming people can share the bread and the cup where, you know, red state people and blue state people can share the the, the bread and the cup. Um, where, you know, people that, you know, want to build a wall with people who are, you know, illegal immigrants can share the bread in the cup. And so we, we spend a lot of time trying to be centered, focused, uh, centered and focused. And so there's a culture that we've created or working to create and that was being, you know, embodied before I ever showed up. That is so attractive to me. Mm. Wow. We don't, we don't religious, we don't do a lot of religious programming. Once a month we, we offer something called the table, which is, invitation of our church to share meals together okay and that's kind of all we do wow and uh and so for the rest um um we try to provoke curiosity and conversation on the weekends leading to the lord's supper um uh, we embody the table as a way of life and then that's kind of it and it's been unbelievably refreshing to not be busy do do you have um a lot of kind of like yeah maybe D church type people there or, um, totally, yeah. totally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I'm all, I'm new to this, right. Cause I pastored California. Um, uh, the Southern Baptist convention is a big deal down here. Like okay. it is right, a okay. big freaking deal. <laughs> really? So there, there are dynamics. Yes. There are dynamics around issues like baptism that, you know, in my non-denominational <laughs> kind of church structures in California, we never had to, that was never a thing, Yeah, but it's very much a thing here. Alcohol, a thing. There are these, these regional issues, race. I mean, very much, we have a Confederate statue in the center of our little town. And, um, and there is a deep sense of mistrust, hmm. um, around, I mean, our church split over masks and mandates um, your church, they uh, out it or yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, we lost hundreds of people, um, because, uh, we were listening to the CDC recommendations and encourage masks. And then at one point we split. So one service was mask required. Another service wasn't. Oh, really? But we were, <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, going to create, two, was, it, create two different churches right there. <laughs> it, it did. Yeah. And and so we're sitting in the middle of this going, okay, so how do we be faithful Jesus people? And the only answer we know is to proclaim Jesus and center ourselves on him and the meal that he gave us, because that's the only thing strong enough mm-hmm. to hold all of that tension together, right? It's not going to be a great or compelling worship. It's got to be something bigger than all of that. Mm-hmm. And so um, it, it's just been interesting because I think a lot of churches in our area sort of had, had to go through that. Mm-hmm that thing there's an energy in the south that's just different than um some of the energies i've been at you know in other places of the country How, so yeah because you're, uh, you're i mean you're yeah. you're a born yankee right and then you go to california oh, for yeah. a while and so living this is this is a different culture for yeah. you right i mean it is are, are absolutely. The, uh, the absolutely the stereotypes of bible belt and stuff is that are they pretty right true but i mean nashville's a little bit like kind of how austin is to texas right like it's a little it's exactly like, Okay. Yes. Yes. Nashville. Nashville's really interesting. Uh, mo- like almost all the people on in our neighborhood are transplants. So there aren't there's such an influx of people right. moving to Tennessee. Um, and some some because it's a very red state and mm-hmm. particularly from California, we have several sets of friends who are thinking about moving um, uh, to, to where we live, which is in Franklin. And um, some because it's a red state, some because it's 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 
small town and country and not not super south but a, a little still cosmopolitan nashville you know has some great universities and obviously the music scene is you know ridiculous yeah. um but but it's been interesting to see the influx of people and that and the influx has allowed us to take some steps away from some of the cultural okay. conventions because not everyone's immersed in them if right that makes right sense. right yeah no totally that that's i mean i've i've been there s several times and that's it, it doesn't feel as stereotypical deep south uh -uh. bible belt you know as as, uh -uh. as other places but i'm you know, but i've heard people say no it's still it's still bible belt like you get you know oh um, yeah people kind I mean, of judge you if you don't go to church or something on sunday <laughs> like if you're walking around town yeah. i maybe not that much but like you know walking around sunday morning people yeah. are like how come we're not in church <laughs> It is a, it is a very highly churched yeah culture for sure yeah. for sure for sure Man. and and there is yeah. yeah so it's just been it's been really in, uh, instructive for me to yeah. um to kind of encounter this and love it and uh, there's much to enjoy and the people here are just ridiculously amazing hmm. uh around the redness of the state that you know mm -hmm. is a big deal do, do you find um are, are people there I, I keep i always hear people that live there saying it's just it, it is a very friendly place like it's just easy to yeah. make relationships but then other people say well though you have that kind of superficial southern charm but to get really deep is hard it, would you say it's kind of a both and or um yes i yeah the stereotype's true for sure like um there is a politeness that <laughs> excuse me, can, can, um, that doesn't lead to much depth, but that's not been our experience in this little community. The experience in this community has been remarkable because I, again, I think there are refugees from the majority church culture mm -hmm. that end up finding, um, places, whether it's a podcast or community that, that where they have permission to doubt and wonder where they, uh, like we, we empower women in all levels of leadership. That's okay. very uncommon, right. um, in our area and, um, which, which, you know, it causes a lot of folks to, to not want to participate. And that's totally great. There are loads of great churches, mm -hmm. you know, that view the opposite view, but, um, there is a, I think a deep hunger everywhere for, um, something that allows, for what the the healthiest podcasts allow for, right? Which is this real engagement with real issues and real people and not pretending yeah. that, you know, everything is as clean cut and as chipper as we sort of want it to be. Yeah. What, what, what's the relationship between your podcast and the church? Is it, does it exist alongside or is it kind of, is it, viewed as like a ministry of the church for lack of better terms or, uh, yeah, great, great question, Preston. Um, I try to keep them separate because, um, the podcast is intended to stir up conversations okay. and I can take, I can make assumptions about my audience that I would not make in a church setting. Okay. So, um, yeah. so like for instance, if I'm in a church setting and we're heading to the Eucharist, and, um, I'm, I'm, I have a set of assumptions about the people in the room and I don't carry those assumptions over into a podcast, uh, as an example. So I would take much smaller bites around issues and questions and frame them much differently in the church than I would on a podcast. Hmm. And not because the, the one is better than the other, but because when you're talking to the same people over and over again, in sort of a pastoral role, there to me feels like there's a follow up responsibility to that that the podcast doesn't always have. Interesting. Have you thought through that? That's 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 well thought out. Have you, have you wrestled with that? We have. I, I have. Yes, for sure. <laughs> just just because you know the church and the church leadership's great. Like they're like, well, yeah. Why wouldn't you talk about the podcast? And I'm like, no, no, no. I don't. Okay. I don't want to because there are people who um, they're not all in the sort of, I have big questions about the faith kind of space. Okay. Yeah. And just to, and just to jump into a podcast on, um, how it is that we're to treat the LGBTQ plus community or, Hey, the Bible in the Bible, God, you know, accommodates human failure a bunch. Mm -hmm. What's that mean? Like, 
you're not just primed for those sorts of conversations and because uh, there's no relational trust that's mm-hmm. been built up. So the relational trust piece that um, I am for the community, I'm not here arbitrarily trying to be controversial or that I'm not trying to build a platform or whatever, that has to be established over years and right. uh, before you can have some of those conversations. I, I've often wondered like, you know, as I constantly exploring like, how it, it or should you know podcasts be integrated into the rhythm of a of a local church um i've often wondered Sorry. like what what if you did like what if what if i was you know in a church that wanted to support the podcast somehow and they said hey what, what if like on sunday night you can do like a live podcast exactly oh, how you do it normally yep. you know but it's just it's it's um <coughs> it's at the church it has embodiment it integrates this kind yes. of more free thinking disruptive flavor that you bring yep. but we we think that that yeah. shouldn't be the totality of church and maybe not even like a um a eucharistically yeah. oriented sunday worship time right. right but we do want it to be part of the rhythm of of the church for people that are are wanting that kind so it's not you could be a part of the church and never come to the <laughs> podcast but you can also be part of the church right. and, and feel like you know, that this is part of my church identity is engaging in yes. more disruptive kind of conversation. And it could be a blend of maybe an audience Q and a, it could be a conversation with yes. me and a Muslim or something. And like, Hey, let's, let's talk through this. That would be the dream. See, that's the dream is that kind of integration would yeah. be awesome. Okay. Can you do that? I'm not, I mean, I'm, I could make a phone call to your leaders and suggest, <laughs> is that something you would want at your church? And is, I don't want to put you on the spot I actually. Cause I don't know. Oh no, 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 you're not. No, no spots, dude. This is so fun. Um, I've been the most resistant one to that. Okay. The church is great. They're magnificent and gracious. I'm the one that's had the, the like, ah, I don't know. Because if I integrate the two, then I have to change the assumptions I make going into the podcast. Hmm. And, um, I'm not sure I want to do that. I want to be able to say things on the podcast without the pastoral weight of, of, declaring from the front of a stage over a people in a position of authority, Hey, you know, we believe this as a, and and I'm trying this on because I mean, I don't see myself in a position of authority or whatever, but in a podcast, the medium allows for, Hey, so let's try this thought on and let's explore it. But I don't know that I would do that in a kind of conventional church setting. Is it and is it because you're you are a teaching pastor there? Like, what if I came to your church as a, just a congregant? I'm just me. Nothing changes. And would would that space be different in that I wouldn't carry the same? I, your phrase, I like your phrase, pastoral kind of responsibility or weight in, into it. Or yeah, yeah, no, I totally yes, I totally think that. And as we've started doing Q and A at at the end of all of our teachings or in the middle of our teachings. That process has been accelerated so that like there's that exploring that's happening in real time. But when I prepare, I'm preparing with sort of different sensitivities in mind um, about what I'd be willing to say and explore and sort of throw out there Hmm. um, as opposed to what I would do on the podcast, which is people can just turn that sucker off and leave. You know, they don't have to ever listen to it again. In a church community, it feels like there's a different dynamic that needs to be respected. Mm. And that sort of Eucharistic dynamic where my role, like my, th- I, I have a great therapist who said, and this will get back to what we're saying, but she asked me once, she's like, whose wounds are you trying to heal when you teach? <laughs> are they your wounds? Oh, wow. And you're trying to, oh, dude, it was changed the way I taught entirely. Mm. But um, when I'm teaching, in a church, I'm thinking about the the benefit of the community in terms of how this is going to play together when we see each other next week and two years from now and whatever, whatever. In a podcast, I don't I don't feel like I, I can I, I have that same sort of back end responsibility. Man, that that's a yeah, that's yeah. I don't know if this is right. I no, totally no. I hear what you're saying because you know when. when I, I think I, I never thought about it, but I think I might have the same kind of assumption. Like people always ask me, you know, why did you have this guest on or that guest, whatever. I, I, my simple answer is like, I want to do 
wanted yeah. to talk with them. They seemed like an interesting person, read their book, disagreed with most of it. So I wanted to hear them out, you know, or whatever, like, um, right. or were there an expert but in this area? And I just want, it really is a selfish yes. in yes. a sense, but that yes. it just so happens that what I'm interested in and, and the way I go about it seems to resonate with another group of people who like to listen in, but I'm not, I'm not thinking right. I rarely, sometimes I do, sometimes I do, but r- usually I, I don't think what would be, how could I best serve my podcast audience? And again, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just, Right. I just like right. having interesting conversations yeah. with people. Um, yes. So, but as yeah. a pastor, you, you do you need to think differently, I think. That's yeah. right. Okay. Huh. And that's been part of my problem in the past has just been thinking, as long as the teaching's good, I don't have to do much else. And I realized, no, 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 that the teaching's the smallest bit, right, of what it is to be uh, a part of a pastoral team. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, I, I love, I love exactly what you're saying. I would have people on the podcast that I would never invite to a church community <laughs> because you haven't loved the church community into a place to receive and discern what it is that they're saying. Well, you know, whereas the podcast community, that's just sort of assumed in the format. So, yeah. No, okay. That's, that's, a, it, so I've often used a distinction of, I view a podcast like, a conversation with my neighbor that I happen to hit record. It's not yeah. a sermon from a stage where it is more. And again, I'm, I'm authoritative might not be the best word, but it is more like, no, okay. I've, I'm not just thinking out loud. I've, I've ironed this out and I am conveying yeah. something that yeah. I do have more con- conviction a- about. Um, that's right. Th- th- that's that's the distinction. I do wonder, I do wonder though, if a church You're could and maybe even need more of the conversation with the, like have the conversation in a, maybe not the Sunday Absolutely. service or whatever, but like have a church embrace yeah. conversation that is purposely messy with the pastor is saying, yeah, I'm not sure what I think about inerrancy and, and, and how to go about this. Yeah. And what do you do with this passage? Yeah. And that? I, I wonder yeah. if that could be pastorally helpful for people. Oh. Absolutely. But think about the relational trust we're cro- required for people sure. to hear that well. Okay. And yeah. so, so like we just had a, a conversation about inerrancy okay. where I was trying to argue one particular definition of inerrancy, which, you know, is one of the more popular ones, but it was like in the original autographs, when all the facts are known and properly interpreted, the Bible never lies, you know, and never, it never, yeah. never disagrees with the facts of the universe. My point was, well, we don't have the original autographs. We don't know what proper interpretation looks like, and we don't know all the facts. <laughs> so is that a helpful way to describe the Bible? <laughs> and I was just saying, well, I don't think it, I don't think it is. Um, I, I think that God doesn't lie and the Bible is faithful in what it records, but I don't think when you talk about like, um, poetry and errant isn't the word I would use there. Right. Um, like when David so, cries so was, out, God, where are you? I feel like you've left me. And someone says, is that an error or not? Right. It's like, that's not the right category to understand someone's right. human emotions, you know, but right. Exactly. Yes. When the, when the psalmist says, God, you know, I pray that you would take the infants of Babylon and dash their heads against the wall. Is that God saying that? Yeah. No, that's the human saying that. Right. And is that an errant? Oh, it seems pretty errant. I know what people mean when they use the word. My point in even bringing up that example is that we had to do several weeks worth of work talking about the Bible Interesting. Yeah. before we had that conversation. You know what I mean? Whereas yeah. on the podcast, it could just come up in conversation. You'd be like, yeah, I'm not sure that's a really helpful concept. Right. And I wouldn't feel the need to sort of lead people into that and lead people out of that while giving them lots of room to be in process with it. Because yeah, no, that's helpful. I I um hmm. Back when I was at the Bible College, I felt like I I treated the classroom almost more like the podcast. Like I wasn't afraid to mm-hmm. explore, deconstruct, let things sit, let them be uneasy. But I had them for a semester, or in some cases, I mean, two years, you know, or it was a small Bible yeah, College, yeah. So sometimes four years, where I'm you know hanging out with them, yeah. doing meals together, yeah. they're watching my kids. Yeah. So there is that. It's, it was kind but of an old man. Absolutely. And it's brilliant that you would teach that way. And that's what made you a great teacher. Hmm. But embedded in the the form of teacher, lecture, student, yeah. 
is the idea that we're exploring together. Yeah. And I, I think there there should be more of that in the church. I'm just saying I feel a greater weight yeah. to lead people in and out of that more than I do on the podcast. I think the ideal would be, quite honestly, something along the lines of what you what you had shared, where um you have the Eucharistic celebration and you have a text that sort of leads us into that. And and then you have um a place where you can have conversations, really honest, authentic yeah. conversations around whatever it was that we were exploring, that built into the format. Yeah, it's the idea that we're we're just going to sit in this and we're not going to resolve it. I think that's beautiful, absolutely. I and think, I think yeah. you could even no, go ahead. I I think it would invite people into the a, a more relational authenticity with the pastor too or the, the person leading the discussion you know like totally like when a pastor preaches a really polished sermon like yeah how much of that is yeah. just totally. really polished and good and everything but like in, a, in an honest conversation where they're having to answer a question that they really don't know the answer to and they're like you know what and I, there's no prep totally there's no prep like you get a lot more you should get a lot yes. more authenticity um, we do we do. Mm. And, and Preston, that's where we capture that bit of the podcast vibe is that people have now started interrupting and raising their hands and, <laughs> you know, saying like, I don't agree with that or I don't understand that or it sounds really cliche. And you're like, this is <laughs> I love that. This, this oh. is marvelous. Right. <laughs> I would love it if somebody said that while I was speaking. Or oh, maybe. dude, there was a guy. It was It was the greatest thing ever. We were in the Sermon on the Mount and we were talking about one of the most, you know, sort of cliche passages about worry and each day has enough, you know, enough trouble of its own. The guy raises his hand. He's like, I hear you, but I feel like you're going to the most cliched place on this. Please tell me you're not. That was his question. <laughs> you look at your notes like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, I know. So exactly exactly where I'm going. <laughs> and what's great, what's great is just simply going, I don't know. Someone will ask a question. And you're like, I, I, I've never thought about that. I don't have any idea. Or we have a couple of psychologists in the room who will, oh wow, yeah, you know, they'll they'll ask a spiritual formation question that has great overlap with psychology, and it'll be like, I'm not sure, but here's this person that you should talk to. Mm, yeah. Like it models all these beautiful things that I think we get to model in the podcast, but I just think there's a trust earned on the ground that is different. Yeah. Um, at the at the sermon level. That's good. And yeah, I, you know, dude. I've often wondered like the independence of, and I'll just say for, for me, you know, my podcast, there, there's no, it's under no authority. It rests on the authority of me and my wife, really. <laughs> and I'm oh, glad she's involved because totally. if it was just me, it might get off the rails. But, um, <laughs> uh, and I've often thought like, cause again, I have such a, I do have a high ecclesiology. Like I actually think, yeah, we should have leaders who are spiritual authorities that we place right. ourselves under. Like I don't, I think that is or can be a, a good thing. And yet I'm doing yeah. this really independent thing. But then I've had pastors right. tell me like, yeah, but if you were under some kind of authority, you wouldn't, your podcast would not be the pod. It wouldn't be what it is now. Like your independence is what is actually in turn. I had, um, Kevin Kim, he, he's, um, he's the kind of co-leader with Francis Chan out in the, you know, um, the, the crazy love ministry and the, the, uh, love we are church anyway, amazing guy. One of my favorite yeah. people on earth. And he's That's like, awesome. no, like you actually help us as pastors and leaders because you are untethered to somebody else saying, well, maybe you shouldn't have that guest on or no, do you really want to, yeah. it's a little too edgy, you know, um, yeah. you shouldn't have yeah. a trans person interview you on a podcast, you know, right. which I did a few weeks ago. Um, Right, uh, right. So I don't know. I, I just wonder if if it, if it is actually more helpful for the church that at least for my little lane that I'm in for it to be independent. Yeah. Um, well, it depends. It depends what you mean by independent. There's spiritually, yeah. like like. So I have a board because we're a five hundred one c three, and I have oh, a board okay. that I answer to. And but they're not church people. <laughs> they're uh, business people and they, they, they have a, they, they love Jesus and they love the church, but they don't see this. They see this as a, a fiduciary responsibility to best serve our audience. So the okay. questions they ask are things like, am I healthy? 
Um, okay. Yeah. Is our co-host Tim healthy? Um, are we in integrous with all the money? Yeah. Um, are we are we thinking about the audience in all things, or are we just doing what's easy to us? Okay. Um, and and that's been really helpful. But what they don't do is go, hey guys. In fact, <laughs> uh, a couple of them might want us to be far edgier. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but they would never just say, you know, they give us feedback absolutely on like how we're executing things. But um, but they would never box us yeah. in sort of theologically, which yeah. is what I hear you being afraid of. And I, I couldn't agree more yeah. with Kevin about that, that that to take that away robs why theology in the raw. I mean, it wouldn't live up to its name anymore. And I, you, you know, know what I mean? To, to, I guess I, I, I do have inform for certainly informal influences for one, like yeah. uh, my pa- the Patreon community. 550 people that and we talk yep. they met we message all the time we do q a podcasts we're going to start doing like zoom chats and everything and they'll they'll say hey i think you should have this person on or they'll say yeah you know yeah. hey you know you said this but i don't think that's accurate here's why and yes. it's, it's all within a relational like we love what you're doing but yep. and and i always tell them you have complete freedom to to say anything that you feel like was less helpful or whatever I'm, i may even disagree and say ah no i'm i'm gonna stick to my guns on this one or whatever and they're fine with that i'm fine with it but um yeah. and you know I've, I've got friends that listen a lot and it's just not a formal like authority but certainly yeah. i'm not just out winging it by myself so I, yeah Absolutely. i don't want to make it sound like i'm just no you know, you're not that. you're not and and there is even within the podcast community there are clumps of like-minded sort of podcasts that we kind of all, I mean, I don't know. I kind of watch what you're doing. I watch what others do. Um, I what, find that very what inspiring. Are some others? Can you, can you name a few that you feel like are in, in similar spaces that you like? Um, I, so a huge one's Holy Post. Holy yeah. Post is interesting because the first part of it's usually just sort of talking about current events, silly news. Yeah. And then they'll have a, um, and then they'll have an interview uh, for the second half of it. And so I, I come across people all the time who who prefer one one of those okay. formats over the other. Um, there's a guy we've had on our show called Tim Gombas. And wait, um, wait, wait, wait. Okay, you so know Tim from Cedarville. I know. One of my good friends. This whole time, do you know you sound, act, talk just like Tim Gomez? I feel like I'm talking to Tim Gombas when I talk to you. You have the same. Really? I was gonna bring it up because I didn't think you knew who he was though. The same oh cadence, goodness. even phrase. You guys are like, oh my, yeah, that's incredible. Well, I think he stole it from me. I, I mean, <laughs> just to be honest. So he, my, he has been a massive influence, but he has um, a podcast called Faith Improvised. Yeah, yeah. He is a New Testament professor and he, his work on, he did a, a podcast series. He's writing a commentary in Romans. Yeah. So he podcasted through Romans. Oh, wow. And I mean, this is not for the faint of heart, man. This yeah. is like, wow. But it's so brilliant. Wow. Yeah. I love, I just absolutely love what he's doing. And um, the, he, the whole cruciform thing was, um, he introduced me to Michael Gorman, oh, who yeah. has been a major, yeah. major influence um, Richard Hayes is another guy that I kind of access through through okay. Tim. Tim's been a, been a good friend, and we talk about you every time, and we talk about Cedarville. Well, how how did you get to know? When did you start? When did you first find Tim? Like, do you guys go way back? So, or? I found Tim. Um, he wrote a book on Ephesians yeah. that I I thought was one of the most helpful yeah. Ephesian commentaries, although it wasn't technically a commentary. And so I, I found him online. He had a blog called Faith Improvised, yeah. and I found him in two, 2010. Oh my god! And yeah. I loved the way that he thought about the Christian life. He was talking about celebrity and weakness and things that yeah. I was really in the middle of wrestling with. And then he and I did a, an event together where we were talking about um, are women free to serve in any capacity in the church, oh, wow. or are the strictures of Timothy and Corinthians really enforced today? And um, just got to know each other then, invited him on the podcast, and then we have him on probably four or five times a year. No way. And it's been really fun. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had him um, on uh, about eight months ago. I think uh, that might nice. have been the first time. Yeah. Yeah, it was – It was. yeah. I mean, he's such he's, a good dude. He's, he's <laughs> such a good dude. Such a good dude. And, and um, 
has opened up Paul for me in ways mm. that I just had not yeah. encountered. And so if there are mannerisms that I'm sure I've taken them uh, from you him. Sound exa- if I close uh, my eyes, I would feel like I'm talking to Tim. Really? Yes. That's incredible. Yes. Even All that. Right, well, Matt, that's, the, that's so Tim right there. <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> well, then, then, uh, then I guess I'm just a pale limitation. Yeah. Um, but his podcast has been, has been really, really good. Um, other ones for me, Greg Boyd, you know, Greg Boyd yeah, yeah. out of uh, Minneapolis. He has one called apologies and explanations. That's literally just him answering questions. Interesting. And yeah. And, um, it, so every episode's like three to four to five minutes and it's just okay. him answering a question huh. and he does he's, it with a guy. He's speaking at my, he's speaking at the exiles conference next year. Oh, I know. Yeah. I'm excited. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, bro, you've. I mean, I'm impressed. I'm not gonna lie. I'm impressed <laughs> at the at some of the fish here uh, that you have landed. Um, but but um, and then there are, then there are smaller sort of regional podcasts. But I actually I don't know about you. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I'm typically, you know, in my own head thinking about the content we're doing yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You know, do you listen to do you listen I to, only, to me? I almost only listen to secular podcasts. Um, Oh, that's good. <laughs> some might, some might say, <laughs> not say it's good. Let me. Um, uh, yeah, like what? Unspeakable with Megan Daum. Um, Ooh. The VPZD show with. Um, oh, who is that? Well, uh, Lex Friedman sometimes. Jo- uh, Joe Rogan. Oh, Barry Weiss um, is probably uh. my favorite. She's my go-to journalist. If anything happens in the news, she's my go-to. Or um, yeah, I follow the, uh, her on Twitter. She's a she's amazing. She's a who? Um, Andrew Sullivan. Sometimes yeah. I listen to yeah. uh, Katie Herzog and Jesse Single blocked and reported. They're they're <laughs> they're really funny, <laughs> but really it. sharp. So yeah, they're they're basically like classical liberal, um, yeah, journalistic types. You know, um. Yeah, that are accused of being kind of right wing because they're on the far extreme left, you know, and they're kind of sick of the, like Barry Weiss is a classic example. I mean, here's a very yeah lesbian atheist checks off all the boxes on being you know liberal, but she's just really yep. turned off by how um yeah heavy handed kind of the far left has become. I just I I just I love listening to people that are just independent thinkers. They're heterodox. They're not yeah. afraid to say something that might go against yeah. whatever tribe they might be in, you know. I mean Rogan's that yeah. way too and um yeah, anyway, yeah. I so I uh, there is a, uh I do list so the pour over podcast is where I get my news from. Have you heard of this? Dude, no, I haven't. Tell it's me. a genuinely nonpartisan 7-minute overview of just give me the facts of what big events huh, tell me what happened down. they're incredible um and we've really? i've had i've had him on the show the guy who founded it um that's basically oh, where i no get my way. i get my news from there just give me the facts and i'll go to like barry weiss or somebody if i want a more in-depth you know conversation um yeah uh, yeah tr- truth over tribe i just had these guys on truth over tribe they discuss that they push back against any kind of like tribalism in, in the church. They're really awesome. I'm really loving those guys. Those are probably the two Christian podcasts. Yeah. And, and I guess there's a few others that I dabble in here and there, but yeah. 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 It is. I, it, it's like, I love if we're, if we're broadening, um, I'd go Conan O'Brien oh. needs a friend. I just love, <laughs> love how I just, I think he's a riot. Um, but yeah, I just find myself, um, doing a lot of thinking and reading and mm-hmm. studying. And I don't often, sometimes if I I'll have podcasts on kind of in the background, yeah. um, <laughs> for, for like sports, like, you know, it yeah. used to be like sports. I would have in the background now it's, now it's fun podcast, but, yeah. uh, I'm not a super attentive, uh, attentive listener, but all that is yeah. to say, I love what you're thinking, man, about, so, so take the conference that you're doing. Yeah. Right. So you're already moving this way. You're yeah. already moving towards incarnation. Yeah. Um, by like, yeah, there's something that you can do in a conference. You just can't do in a series of podcasts. Guys. It's just different. Right. 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 To yeah. Gather people for three yeah. days as opposed to just have all of those same guests 
right. on your podcast. Yeah. That was so, I mean, honestly, me, because most people there, we had what, like maybe 1,100 people. I would say about- I don't know. That's amazing. And about 95% were from out of town. Like there was, I had a show of hands. Who here is from out of, out of Idaho? And the whole, like everybody's hand went <laughs> I did talk to some people that were like, hey, I couldn't, my hand didn't go up, but you didn't, you know, you couldn't see it. But um, so, and almost everybody was there, had some relationship with the podcast. So I'm meeting people- mm. For the first time, names I've heard, they've sent them questions, some are Patreon supporters and stuff. Holy. It was so fun to yep. get that embodiment, you know? I mean, and, and there was yeah. a wide range. You could tell from what they were cheering at and what they were kind of booing at during the conference, like where they... So it was a fairly broad, theologically broad audience, I would say. Um, it That's could, awesome. could be broader, but I mean, in terms of conferences, usually conferences are put on, everybody has the same perspective. Holy. People come because they want to be be encouraged in what they already believe, you know, maybe that's too cynical, yeah. but, um, yeah, this was a pretty broad, broad I think that's of great. people. Um, yeah, it was I fun. just find it interesting. You're moving that way. It's fun. Man. And yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, but the, the, the people who love the church bit more than I do are my kids, um, mm. to be in a church where yeah. that sort of wrestling is done and yeah, it's just been phenomenal phenomenal for them. So they, they actually have hope that, um, and it's certainly not perfect. My Lord, no, Yeah, yeah. but it's been super healthy so far. Yeah. And, um, to have places to ask questions and be yeah. skeptical and be curious has been yeah. really great. Cause they certainly do not listen to their freaking dad's <laughs> podcast. I can tell you that. You know what I did? I, I just had my, um, third daughter on the podcast. Um, it won't Ooh. come out for, maybe till November. Um, but so we, we, do, she, she's an Enneagram five deep, deep thinker, high BS mm. meter and has, she reads like a ton of <coughs> books and just like sweetest kid in the world. Um, a, but a deep thinker, like, a I, at first you would yeah. you'd meet her and she's just so kind and loving and everything. And then she'll throw you a bomb of a theological question. You're like, I've never oh, heard that, that question before. And I don't know what I think about that. Um, so we, we go out to, um, chips and salsa every couple of weeks. And I said, all right, she keeps lists of theological questions. You know, oh, why did God have to kill the Canaanites? You know, yep. like, okay, soldiers, I get that, but women and children, you know, and then I'm like, well, there's other ways to interpret this. And she's like, well, I don't know. Are you just like trying to cover up something that's difficult or was that really what the text says? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, dude. Oh, dude. Why did oh, God kill already. Ananias and Sapphira for lying? Um, and right. doing, he did really bad stuff, but there's other people doing bad stuff. How can he doesn't kill them? Is God going to kill me if I lie? Why not? That doesn't seem fair. He doesn't kill me, but he kills them. Um, just on and on and on. So we just basically did that live conversation without, I didn't know ahead of time what she's going to ask me. And we just went through her question. So yeah. Anyway. Oh, that's, well, that's one good way to get him to listen. I like that. Yeah. That's so smart. <laughs> um, she's your what? 13, 14. She's my th uh, 15, 15 year old. Yeah. 15. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Man, kids, that is awesome. How old are your kids? We're similar. We're I have uh, nineteen, seventeen, right. and almost fourteen. That's right. Yeah. So we're yeah we're cooking, baby. It, we're in the middle of it. <laughs> Giddy up. They like living in uh, you, Franklin. They they do absolutely. It's just um, it's a it's a little different pace than what we were used to. So they were born and raised in California, and oh, so it's yeah. just the the pace of life is so much healthier and okay. yeah. yeah it's been great yeah that's you cool, should man. think about it someday i don't know i don't know i don't know Preston. i don't know maybe you should yeah we we came really close a couple times moving out there i know we'll see what the that's Lord why is. i'm just saying like well i'll keep a what are they what's the motel at i'll keep a light on for you <laughs> yeah, yeah. do that <laughs> absolutely You're showing your age yeah i yeah. won't lie man oh, i might man. move just for the barbecue though oh my gosh let me let me tell you Ugh. that that is facts. And Nashville hot chicken is a real oh. thing, and it's wonderful. Yeah, the uh, yeah food in general there is just oh my god. Yes. I, I start planning yeah. whenever I travel to Nashville. I swear, two weeks ahead of time, I'm already on Yelp planning my like meal schedule. <laughs> That's fair. That is absolutely oh. fair. Yeah. No question, man. Uh, I'm just so proud of you, bro, and I love what you're up to. And um, thank you. I, it's I, I you're such a great interviewer because um, 
Like I, I had no idea what we we're going to talk about, but okay. you get, you get onto something and you just ask a million questions <laughs> and I love it. And you're thinking about it and it's just, it's so fun, dude. I had so, no clue what we're going to talk about. Well either. done. Yeah. I forgot you're yeah. even coming on. I look at my calendar. I'm like, Oh, I'm talking to Mike right now. <laughs> just kidding. Oh, I, well, I knew, I, I knew I, you're coming on. That's a joke. That's hurtful. I look, I've been looking forward to this for months. So <laughs> I dressed up, I dressed up, I did my hair. <laughs> Do you still have Rogaine, Rogaine model or Rogaine something on your Twitter profile? Heck yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. Heck yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, yeah. what are you going to do with this? You know, <laughs> I'm married. So that check that box, but you should get otherwise, a big goatee and a Harley. You could, you could rock that. Yeah. I could totally rock that. You're yeah. absolutely right. Or be a bouncer is the other option I've yeah. been thinking about. <laughs> I'd be a good, I'd be a good bouncer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, Preston, listen, it, as long as you keep your hat on, you look great. All right. <laughs> so just keep it on and, uh, you know, be perpetually I, 35. Yeah. I do wear a hat a lot. I mean, I've just, I've always worn hats, but like, oh, they're so gray, dude. And like, I feel like every month I'm getting gray. It's just like, it, it's just like yeah. going very gray really fast, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But just shave it, man. I mean, that, I shave it? is there any gray here? Nope. No gray. No. I had it shaved oh. probably 10 years ago. Not not quite like skin, but it was really short for about oh. a couple of years. It was fun. It was like a low okay. maintenance, you know, but yeah. It was very low maintenance. Absolutely, dude. Well, buddy, I got to run. Uh, thanks so much for the conversation. Yeah. And um, I, I, yeah, I I, uh, I would love to keep the dialogue ongoing about just kind of an ecclesiology of podcasting and um yeah if you have any other thoughts or revelations or out-of-body experiences along those lines let me know we'd love to keep thinking about that'd it. be really fun yeah absolutely man thanks hey thanks for the convo i love it yeah you too man show is part of the Converge Podcast Network. Hey friends, I just want to invite you to consider joining the Theology Nara Patreon community. This is a group of followers who believe in the ministry and work of Theology Nara and want to support it financially. And honestly, I've been so impacted by the people who have chosen to support this podcast. Um, every month they send in a bunch of questions. A lot of them are really personal and I get to spend time responding to them in a private podcast. And we, you know, we'll message each other throughout the month and post responses to each other's questions. Um, I'm actually going to start something new this fall, a month monthly live Zoom chat with some of the members. And I'm super looking forward to actually seeing more of their faces every month. And there's other perks to come up. Like, you know, they all get free, uh, a free virtual pass to the Theology and Around Exiles in Babylon conference every year. But honestly, I don't want to make it sound transactional. Every single Patreon member that I've talked to says the same thing. We like all the perks. Uh, we're thankful for them, but we're just more thankful to support the ministry of theology in the raw, and we're glad to do so. So if this is you, if you've been impacted by Theology in the Raw, you can join the Theology in the Raw community for a minimum of five bucks a month by going to patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw. That's patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw. Um, the link is in the show notes.